Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. Well, it's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining me to review the papers is Professor Camilo Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Fantastic. Okay, to... Today we'll be starting with the Daily Trust, and the Daily Trust well leads with a, um, a rather security story. Now it says two thousand five hundred and eighty-three Nigerians killed, two thousand one hundred and sixty-four abducted in three months, and that is a report. Well, it says we've reduced casualty figures. That is from the NSA. Says uh, there are over three hundred bandit warlords in the north, and fleeing villagers storm Zamfara government house. Now, we've known um, about a, the insecurity issue that, that has, you know, just rocked Nigeria for the past few years. In fact, um, now they go and they abduct children from school. That started from the Chibok girls, and we've seen that over the years. In fact, um, in the past few months, there's been, you know, the one from the southwest. There's also been the one from the north as well um, in Kajina states. And so we're seeing all of this, people getting kidnapped, people getting killed, um, farmers having to um, have to leave their farms. And so obviously that has a ripple effect with our economy or the prices or um, produce in the market. So we're just seeing all of this happening. People are being getting kidnapped. People are getting killed. People are being robbed. People are being harassed. Um, and I'm just wondering what's happening with our security um, apparatus in Nigeria. Do you think they're doing enough or do you think they're not doing anything at all? Um, I, I think they are doing something, but it's not um, uh, big enough to solve the problem. Mm. Because you see, an average of uh, 2,583 people killed in three months is as if Nigeria is in the war. Now, if we are to compare like what is happening in uh, uh, Palestine and uh, maybe Ukraine, the average has not been more than this. So I think this shows that um, there is a lot for us to do, especially in terms of uh, security. Because security is um, the first priority of uh, any government uh, to secure its own population. But a situation where you have such huge number taking place, on the average, it is about 80-something uh, uh, people per day. So I think even if we are at war, this is what is likely going to happen. Uh, to me, I think the security are doing their best, but their best is not good enough to address the situation. So if you were to advise, what would you advise? Maybe there's something that the Nigerian government is not doing and that we probably need to let them know. Um, what would you advise them to do? Because this is quite alarming. 2,583 Nigerians killed and 2,164 abducted. And now, we don't even know the um, the status of the ones that are, that are abduct abducted. And looking at how Nigeria moves, um, because we don't have a lot of data, this 2,583 might just be what's on paper. Of course, there would be so many more that haven't been recorded. So what does the Nigerian... Um, police, you know, all of the security agencies, what do they have to do to ensure that the lives and properties of Nigerians are secured? If you were to advise them. Yeah, you see, one of the major source of uh, this problem is that uh, in Nigeria, there are a lot of ungovernable spaces where the government is not felt in, in the areas. And uh, as you say, this will, have, will just be an estimate. If actual figures are to be taken, they will be more alarming than this. So I think what the government needs to do uh, is to go down to the grassroots uh, level and address the uh, situations, okay? Uh, we, we must have synergy. Uh, between uh, the three tiers of government in the first place. Secondly, uh, we know in all parts of Nigeria, uh, the traditional institutions are very effective. So the government must have a way to co-opt them into the process. And most importantly, the government must put emphasis on preemptive uh, measures 
that is to prevent it. By the time you allow the things to take place, already has the security has collapsed. So prevention is better than cure. And what do you do? The government uh, will have to, you know, rely heavily on security information. And once they get it, they have to take action. One of our major problems is that uh, we get uh, information and the people in charge will sit down and will do nothing until it happens. So unless we take uh, that proactive measures, uh, sadly, the government has to actually, actually see security agencies are equipped and are financed in such a way that they have the motivation uh, and the capacity uh, to take actions. Otherwise, we see we have been seeing as uh, a uh, soldier killed here, security agency here, and so on. And then, lastly, the government has to uh, address the issue of uh, corruption. Mm. Because one of the reasons why this thing is uh, continuing unabated is the fact that some people are benefiting from the insecurity. In other words, it is a cash cow for them, so they will not want it to finish. I let the government address these issues. I think uh, uh, we will have a long way to go in terms of arresting the insecurity in Nigeria. Yeah, and, and you know, speaking about in, information, just like you said, um, they always complain that there's not enough intel or they don't have enough, um, you know, apparatus to carry out their duties. Um, but I, sometimes I wonder, for instance, what happened in um in the north right i think that was from christmas day to the early part in fact those people were writing them letters that they were coming back to their villages we hear that there were there were distress calls for about three hours and no one went to the rescue so sometimes i wonder why we just sit on this information if you know that um the people harassing other people in a village then you have to swiftly get there because that's the only way you can catch them you don't come days after and expect to catch them so definitely, you know, something needs to be done to arrest this menace in our society. And which leads to my next question. What do you think about the fact that we've talked about um, state police? So now a lot of people, in fact, um, the House of Assembly or rather the House of Representatives have even brought it up and talking about, you know, state police. Do you think this would also help um, to curb insecurity in our nation? Yeah, it will help in one direction, but uh, to me, I think having state police will also generate another kind of problem. But as far as uh, addressing the issue of uh, insecurity is concerned, I think state policing will help because if we are able to raise the security agents, you know, from among the community, uh, they will be able to know they they will have intelligence report on on the issue, but doing that by itself will may not necessarily work because you see one thing with Nigeria is we have the tendency to 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 create institutions and we don't finance them, we don't train them. So even if you have local government police, not even state. Uh, Police, unless they are equipped, unless they are financed and supported, and they are motivated and well trained, that that will not solve the problem. Look at what is happening now. Uh, I think even to us, uh, uh, not long ago, Dangote here in Kano, I don't know whether other part of Nigeria, uh, you know, uh, supplied the police with uh, vehicles. But now most of them are uh, almost uh, dead. Mm -hmm. Because you see even a DPO having a police by a vehicle, then there is no uh, money for pulling mm -hmm. it, there is no money to repair it, and even it goes to the extent that you go to some uh, uh, police uh, depots or mm -hmm. positions, and you find out that even the uniform are not given. So that they will come, somebody will get to boot, somebody will get trousers, somebody will get shot. How do you maintain a police like that? If they are not well equipped, if they are not financed, if they are not well trained, if they are not well motivated. So even if you create a uh, police, a uh, state police, you are just going to create a money gazilla. You will have chunk of money where it will go and it will not serve the purpose if they are not uh, trained as I've said. Mm. 
Well, I hear you. Um, and I also like to, you know, say kudos to the commissioner of the FCC and the one in River State as well, because I mean, watching the news unfold, I've seen that they've been able to nab um, some of these criminals and just put them behind bars. So at least we can tell that they are working. Now we don't know if it's enough, but we just hope that they'll continue to work and just put in their best because we want a safe Nigerian, a safe Nigeria for all. Okay, so moving over to some economic matters. On the Daily Trust, it says federal government to get fresh $2.2 billion World Bank loan. And that is being said by the finance minister. Now, we keep taking loans. I know we always say it's okay to take loans, but what are we using the loans for? With, you know, this current administration, and you see how they've been able to splurge on several things. Do you think we still need to be getting loans? And don't you think we need to look for how to make more revenue than just getting loans? Because it seems loans are just a way, to, a way of bailouts and say, oh, we need money. Let's bail us out. Let's get a loan. We need money. Let's get a loan. We're not thinking we need money. How do we make money? What do you think about this story? The fact that um, uh, the finance minister has come out to say that federal government is to get $2.2 billion loan from the World Bank. You see, this, this, is, this is one of the problems that we are having. Uh, we know that these loans are the source of uh, the economic crisis that we have in Nigeria since uh, uh, 1985 or so when we uh, delved into sub to get, we have not been able to get out of the problem. In fact, we are sinking deeper and deeper yeah. into the economic crisis as a result of uh, this law. The reason is that loans come with a string attached to them. There are so many conditionalities that we are seeing, and at the end of it, they affect the Nigerian economy, they affect the people, they affect the country in general. So I think it is uh, being uh, uh, penny wise and pound foolish to go and start uh, taking this loan. If you look at even the loan, uh, they, they, I, I think they, they explained it that they are going to get this loan and it is going to be for 40 years, which means we are going to mortgage our country in the next 40 years mm -hmm. on that issue. And that it is going to be a single digit uh, interest and that there will be a moratorium of about 10 years. So all these are, you know, sugar coated uh, things that are putting down our throat so that we can now take the loans. And we know the conditionalities that we are, they are going to happen. At least, if we have destroyed our own time, let's not destroy the future of our uh, mm -hmm. uh, children. Because by the time you take a loan now, by 40 years, virtually, if not all of us will not be there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. those who are wise enough to understand what you are going, in the next 40 years, you are just mortgaging the future of our children and grandchildren. We are settling them with their responsibilities and we are enjoying the money. And they, you know, part of the, the money impact, we, many people will embezzle it. Uh, there will be corruption, there will be embezzlement, mm -hmm. and then we settle uh, the future. So I think, um, Loan to me is a wrong way to go. Uh, it is, in fact, a, a bad way to go into uh, solving our own problem because it is uh, the source of our problem and it is compounding our problem. So by taking these things, like I say, we are engaging the future. Mm -hmm. You know, I just see this as a case of would I call it an entitled child um, whereby, oh, I need some money, daddy send me some money. You're not trying to think of how to make money. And I don't think that's the way to go. We have a lot in Nigeria that we, we can explore. Aside uh, crude, because everybody is fixated on crude. Oh, we have crude, we'll sell crude, we'll make money. But what are we doing with agriculture? What are we doing with tourism? Um, what are we doing with education? In fact, um, Nigeria had the best universities at some points and people from all over Africa will come here to study. So the same way we're shipping our kids over to the UK, people were actually coming to study in Nigeria. So there are so many options, um, so many opportunities rather that we can explore and you know get money. All of our manufacturing um, companies are leaving. Why? Because you know the environment is not sustainable for them. The economy is not sustainable for them. And so they're leaving. Why are we not trying to manufacture more and export? 
we need to start thinking of how to be an exporting country for us to make more revenue. And that way, you know, even the loans that we've taken in the past, how do we intend to service them? Because if you're not making money, you're going to keep taking loans. And I don't think that is the right way to go. I feel like the Nigerian government needs to put a stop to loans and say, let's start making money. Let's, let's manage what we have, really. All right. Um, we, we, we keep on. We, sorry, we keep on giving lip service to this idea of diversifying our own economy. Mm. So, so, have it been we seriously face this issue? I think uh, we, we we are taking the right step. But the way we now put our, all our eggs in one basket, I think it is a dangerous step. Right. Okay. So that's a small headline at the bottom that says, despite increased derivation fund. All producing states owe 1.6 trillion naira. So, what do you think about that? But I want to tie it with um, the major headline on the business NG because this is talking about crude, sort of. And the major headline on uh, the business NG says Port Harcourt refinery to cut fuel prices below 500 naira per liter. Now, that sounds like a very very good you know good idea <laughs> and it's something that would lift the hearts of people but i don't know if that's going to happen and when it's going to happen but what do you think about all of this story so the one um on the daily trusts about you know the oil producing states you know owing 1.6 trillion naira and then the one on the business entry that talks about well our fuel prices might just be 500 naira per liter uh, you see, let's take uh, the, 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 uh, the second one, yeah. uh, the issue of potato refinery. If you read the news, what they are saying, this is the one, uh, the amount that they are going to sell to uh, the marketers. Mm. Already the marketers are getting it at uh, 567, and they are selling it at 670 and something. So this is going to be a good news. But it's not likely going to translate into the price coming down. Mm. Because already, if you look at the news, like I said, they are getting it at 567 uh, from NNPC. So they are selling it at uh, 670 and in some places up to even 700. Mm. They are making money. So even if the potato refinery will cut it down to uh, 500, which uh there is a good news unless the marketers decide also to cut it we are not going to see something and this is one of the problem you know the government says uh, it's a pre-market something they will not even sit down and talk to the marketers that look if it, if it comes down try also to bring down the price unless the government intervenes even if our potato refinery were to sell it at 400 we are not likely going to see change because, like we keep on saying, some of our problem of inflation is attitudinal. People want to make money, so they want to take advantage at anything. Uh, even if they bring it, I don't think they will do it unless there are measures to force them to bring it. Mm -hmm. Now, the other story that you talk about, uh, yeah. you know, oil producing state, oil, such huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. You see, it is an indication of uh, the corruption in Nigeria. Because, you see, uh, besides what they get from the federal, there are percentage, I think about certain percent derivation that is given to them. And despite the huge amount of money, you don't see it on ground. The people don't feel it, only the elite corner these things. So I think this is part of the corruption. That is why they are still oil. Otherwise, the oil producing uh, sector uh, states have no uh, recent mouth to say anything because they get such huge amount of money. And uh, compare it with their population, they are small so they are state in terms of size, in terms of population. In fact, had it been there is a accountability and uh, you know honesty in terms of using the resources, the oil producing uh, state will be far ahead uh, ahead of any state in Nigeria, even Lagos, they will be far ahead of it. But here we are, they are always complaining, no resources and so on. And the irony of it is that despite the money that they guzzle, 
they are now you know selling it to the ordinary people their citizens and the citizens are always at look ahead that is why they, they are protests here we want oil this and one and so many crises the ordinary person doesn't know what is being done with such huge amount of money mm -hmm. because he's confused he's not allowed to know that this money is coming out and if it comes uh he, he, he doesn't see the benefit they are talking of uh, you know spillage they're talking of so many things which could have uh, been addressed had it been such amount of money which amount of money is properly and judiciously utilized Mainly, like honestly, it is not being utilized because sometimes you just wonder, like, what are they doing with development? You have such huge money. What are you doing with it? Why can't the um, common man in Nigeria, you know, see it? Why is it not reflecting on the economy in general? You're just taking this money and we don't know what's going on. Um, anyway, so I'm going to move over to another story. And um, well, this one talks about disbursement. <laughs> yeah, it says federal government initiates disbursement of conditional cash grants to support households. So obviously we just talked about monies that are not being um, utilized for development to ensure that even people can maybe make money. Because if you develop a state, um, obviously we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about industries, we're talking about things that would probably employ these people and definitely they can make more money. But now you're not going to put all of that in place. Instead, you're given conditional grants um, to support households. Why are you not having an economy that these people can thrive for themselves? They can, you know, try to make money for themselves, then giving them hand handouts. Because that's what I would call a conditional grants, a conditional cash grant. You're not going to give them what they need to be able to fish. Instead, you want to give them fish all the time. Why can't the federal government look for ways and means to ensure that? Almost every Nigeria is almost every Nigerian is employable. You go out, you go to school, you come out, we employ you, you make money, you know, you set up a nice family. I know that, you know, our parents' generation, they had that. You can easily go to school, you can easily become a civil servant, and you can buy a house, build a family. But right now it is really difficult. And then what they give you is handouts, conditional grant loans, palliatives why how have we even gotten to this point that is just take this take that what do you think about this story uh it's politics to put it in simple words you see these are things that uh, the politicians when they do they will be able to show the people you know already the people have been put in poverty in the uh, ignorance you know uh, and so on so by the time you now give them this kind of out they will just come out and their attention will be uh, diverted to this issue of hand out and uh, that is what they will easily score political points through that. But uh, the other way, the, the reality is that had it been these monies are pumped into making, you know, create a conducive environment for the economy to survive, you don't need to give hand out to the yeah. people. By the time you, you now have uh, the environment conducive, Many people, it, it's not necessarily that the government will have to employ everybody. The private sector will employ. Some will be self-employed. Some will be able to develop. When you talk, you say you are, uh, our parents, they say, no, even us, you know, our own generation, we have benefited from that. Okay? We have from, benefited from that, but unfortunately, we are wasting what we have benefited. Okay? Instead of you know, we benefit from it, let's uh, better it so that our children and their grandchildren will come and do it. We decided to take the easiest way, which is the political way, uh, by dishing out uh, hand out, by making our own citizens beggars, okay? By giving them hand out. So I think uh, it's a very wrong policy, it's a wrong way to do it. Uh, after all, uh, we are, the government is not giving the citizen fish forever. It is for a short time. So what will happen after like three months or five months that they say they are going to do it? Which means the people will be back. We are toying with a, a very delicate uh, situation. So I think um, what the government should do is instead of going into that palliatives, address 
the source of the problem and create a conducive atmosphere for things to uh, survive so that people will stand on their own rather than to depend on handouts. Mm. Well, let's move over to the punch. So on the punch, well, the punch leads with Emifile's um, social programs and it says banks withhold 530 billion Naira CBN funds, Cardoso may order refund. Now the writer says Access Bank, GTB, FCMB, six others keep on use funds, SME seek fresh loans. And NFIU, NERSAL, to trade, um, to tackle anchor borrow, borrowers loan, um, loan defaulter, CBN rules out intervention. What do you think about this? Well, banks are withholding 530 billion Naira CBN funds. You see, it's part, the part of the back and forth policy in Nigeria. Initially, we think, you know, the government will come, you know, intervene in order to, uh, you know, promote uh, development. Now the government is saying, uh, the CBN is saying it's going to withdraw. It will just take an advisory uh, role. And uh, if somebody comes tomorrow, that person is likely going to take another. So the lack of continuity in yes. our own policies, well, it's also part of the reason why we are just taking one step forward and two step uh, backwards. Because one would come and say, okay, what was being done by the previous thing, we are going to change it. And then another person will come and say, okay, let's go back to this. Like what is happening now? Actually, uh, this intervention uh, to some extent uh, uh, did help in certain areas but I know and everybody knows in Nigeria that also the intervention have their own problem because they created uh, a huge bureaucracy because they facilitated a uh, corruption in the sector but I think instead of looking at that uh, the government should look at uh, what are the problems with that intervention and then we address the problem. Instead of throwing the baby with the basin water, we can now look at how do we adjust. This is how public policies are made. Okay, when you assess the policy and you find out there are problems here and there, you address the problem. Unless it is absolutely necessary, that is when you abandon the policy. But by the time you take this issue of abandoning this and uh, you now come with something new, before uh, you even get settled, your time will run out. And then somebody will come and start afresh. So I think this issue of lack of continuity is part of the problem. Well, I agree with you because I feel like most administration, when they come, they want to do their own. So most times you never really say, what has my predecessor done? What can I implement? Um, what can I do better with this? But instead you scrap it out and say, you know what? I want my own. I want my own name in shining lights. And it's quite unfortunate because if you want to grow, you need sustainability. And sustainability comes from continuity. And, you know, it just helps, you know, the nation grows. Um, so let's move over to another story. This one talks about federal government rolls out 2,700 CNG buses, tricycles, May 18. Now, I know that the federal government had promised about 100 um, electric buses, but we haven't seen that till now. Um, and now we're hearing that 2,700 buses, well, CNG buses in this case, and tricycles will be delivered, if I can use that word, by May 18. What do you think about this? I mean, looking at the trajectory of things whereby we've had promises and they don't um, come to fruition, what do you think about this one? And do you think it would even, you know, help with the transportation system in the country, one? And um, aside helping, aside having enough, you know, buses, I'm talking about prices as well. Would that help with the prices, um, you know, that people spend on transportation in the country? I'm a little bit pessimistic on, on this issue because you see what happened is um, where these promises have been made almost a year ago and up to now the vehicles have been delivered. Uh, if you read the news carefully, they say even the Chinese uh, tricycle are yet to come. And the other thing, they are still making preparations in this. So now we have less than a month to uh, the deadline. So if you, could not, if you are not able to make it 11 months uh, ago, I don't think, uh, unless there is miracle, there is magic. 
then it will happen in less than one month. So that is one of the reason of my pessimism. Uh, the second thing is the fact that even if we have been born on ground, you see, only two states have this CNG capability. So uh, out of the 36, where you can take them? Perhaps you can have them in Lagos and maybe Port Harcourt. But in the up north here, you can hardly have it. Like here in Canada, you don't have even uh, the, the thing. And the third reason for my uh, this pessimistic view is the fact that look at what happens with uh, cooking gas. You know, uh, the government encourage people, you know, not to uh, deforest uh, their this and go on instead of fire with this. But they keep on, uh, you know, raising the price. So even if you have these uh, CNG vehicles, um, at the end of it, they are not going to be cheaper because uh, the thing will be more uh, expensive than it is now. And uh, the first reason that I have this thing is the fact that they will not be uh, sufficient enough. We have 36 uh, states. How many are you going to have? Are you going to concentrate them in the capital only? And will that one affect the, uh, the, the system? So I think um, it's part of the, the problem that we have said earlier on. The government needs that, uh, you know, is more concerned with the political gain of such things than actually addressing the problem. Mm. Well, all right, so we have to wrap it up now and in the next one minute. So let's just take this one on The Guardian. It says, APC's internal crisis lingers as another ward if school issues Ganduji fresh suspension. Now, this is moving over to some political matters. What do you think about what's happening in the APC now? We've seen um, stuff like, and other stuff like this happen with the, P, with the Labour Party, where, in fact, they had called for the leader of the Labour Party party's resignation um you know even in the pdp there's a little bit of some ruckus as well and obviously the apc and here it says apc's internal crisis lingers as another word esco issues ganduji a fresh suspension what's your take on this in just a minute as we wrap up you see this is what is happening right here in kano is the issue of uh, political vendetta between groups and uh, you also look at what happened in other parties always you know because of the vendetta among the politicians they try to pull down uh, candidate this is what happened to uh, adam oshamele uh, to uh, the immediate past uh, chairman of pdp and now it is happening to uh, ganduji so i think it's uh, the politics of intolerance that is happening in nigeria mm. All right, this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment. Um, Professor, we want to say thank you for coming. It's always lovely reviewing the papers with you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Have a lovely day. All right, I've been speaking thank with to you. You too. All right, I've been speaking with Professor Camille Sani Fagi. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. And we've just been reviewing the papers, taking global stories, making headlines in our national dailies. We'll go on a short break. And when we return, we'll be talking about, well, Serap is asking the 36 state governors and Wiki to, you know, just be more transparent. See you soon.